Kiko and music went in. And he will speak about something like that. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice invitation. Uh, as I was telling to Pablo before the, the lecture, uh, I feel that I'm new in this uh, community. So I mostly work in, in population genetics, in mathematical population genetics. And recently, uh, some breaches between uh, population genetics and interacting particle systems have been built. And I am very happy to share this um, story here uh, today. And what I'm going to do is to start describing duality as I think about it, as I learn it in this uh, population genetic framework. And then I will um, move to the simple exclusion process and explain some uh, insights that one can get by thinking in this more probabilistic, probably terms about uh, duality. Um, what I have here is the, the Greit Fisher random graph. This uh, random graph was introduced to understand the change of a, of a population through time. And let me start this talk by, by talking about it. So it's a graph, so I need to tell you the set of vertex and the set of edges. Um, the set of vertex is, um, well, for each integer number, I give numbers from one to n. And this uh, should be thought as, a column should be thought as a point in time. A vertex should be thought as an individual. And this column uh, is the ancestors of this column here. Right? So it's a temporal um, construction. And in each column, I have the, the same population size, with the, which is this number big N. So once I have the vertex, I put edges and they are random. So this is why it's a random graph, the edges are random and they are rather simple. So each individual choose its mother uniformly at random from the previous generation. So this individual choose this and this happened with probability one over N. And with this simple and local rule, we construct a bi-infinite uh, random graph. So the, the edges represent the relation uh, mother uh, daughter. Um, once we have the graph, we can construct some stochastic process on top of it. So for example, we can color uh, some generation, our favorite generation, and use the rule that each individual copy the color of its mother. Um, this is again uh, an idea of the propagation of genetic information through time. So this individual will be red because its mother is red. And we can see that by coloring generation zero, immediately we induce um, a coloring for the whole, uh, well, for half infinite uh, graph. Right. And one very important observation at the time was that just by this simple uh, construction, we can see that one color goes to fixation while all, all the other get uh, lost. And this is not the action or, of selection or anything, it's just the action of lock. So, Back in, in the 30s, this was an important observation because you need to consider Darwin's theory. And well, what this construction said was that only by the act of lock, some uh, types uh, are preserved and some other are, are not. And this tells us that the, the evolution is a, is a very random phenomenon itself. Um, so we want to embed some stochastic process, some Markov process on this graph. And we can do at least in, in two ways. For example, we can follow the frequency of red individuals as we travel through time. So at generation zero, we have one individual type zero. So we have the frequency one divided by N and we continue to divide by N and so on and so forth. And this is a, a Markov process. So if I tell you the frequency here, you know, the distribution of the frequency at this time. And it's a process that will be absorbed at zero and at one. Another process that we can construct on this probability space made by the graph is the backward process or the ancestral process. So now we give ourselves a sample, a sample of n individuals in some gener generation, and we will start traveling back 
in the graph. So at this time, everybody is its own ancestor. We want to count the number of ancestors. So at time zero, we have just n ancestors. And then when we move one generation back, well, we count the number of ancestors and see how this is a decreasing process, right? So we start with five, now it's three, two, two, and at some point it will hit one and it gets absorbed at one and it stayed forever. And this point is, well, rather important in population genetic is the, the time to the most recent common ancestor. Okay, so the real discussion today is what can we say about these the two processes, about the relation of these two processes, just because they live on the same random graph. So how can we relate one process with the other using that they are constructed in the same probability space? And to answer this question, let us make some trivial observations. So if I take one individual here and I ask what's the probability that this individual is red, given that the frequency of red individuals is X, um, so what is this probability? Well, chooses its mother uniformly at random, so obviously it's just x. If we make the same question, but for n individual, what's the probability that all these n individuals are red? Well, they choose independently, so it's just x to the n. Okay, so let's make the question slightly more difficult. Imagine that at generation zero, I know that the frequency is x, and I take a sample at generation t. So what's the probability that all the members of my sample are red, given that I know the frequency at time zero? The thing is that I have two ways to answer this question. I can either start here, where I know the frequency, and propagate the frequency all the way until t minus one. So if I know the frequency here, well, each individual choose uniformly and independently. So I know that the probability that all of these are red is just the frequency to the n, right? So the probability that all these guys are red is just the frequency process at time t minus one to the n, right? Okay, but we can also answer this question thinking backwards in time. How do we do this? Well, we start with our sample, we go backward, and we observe that in order for all these individuals to be red, all their ancestors have to be red, right? So by the propagation of the color rule that we imposed, it's a if and only if all of these are red, then all the ancestors are red. So if now I condition on the numbers of ancestors here, which is a t minus one, if somebody tells me how many ancestors I have, each of them needs to choose uniformly and independently. So the probability that all these individuals is red is the probability that all these individuals is red, which is just X to the AT minus one. What I did so far is not calculating this probability, but because the probability doesn't depend on how I calculate it, what I prove is that this equality hold true. So the end moment of the frequency process, it's equal to the probability generating function of the ancestral process. And this is what is called moment duality. So it's a very strong relation between these two processes because, well, the frequency process is a process in zero one. So it's characterized by the moments. And this is the probability generating function so I also characterize the distribution of the ancestral process. So with this formula, somehow I formalize in the idea that if you know the past, you can say things about the future and the other way around. So this is somehow the mathematical formula that tells you this. Okay, so this is called moment duality. And what is sample duality? Well, sampling, sampling duality is the technique that I use to put, prove this moment duality. So whenever I have some graph, or some probability space, and I put two processes in it, and I can say things of one using the other, then I am using the technique sampling duality. And in this case, I use sampling duality to prove moment duality. Let me put a, a bit of notation here. 
So if I have two processes, X and Y, and a function that go from the sp state space of each um, to R, well, I say that these two processes are dual if this relation holds. So basically I have that the starting point of X is little x, and I evaluate this expectation in a random point xt. And in the other side of the equation, the x and the y change the roles. So now the y is random, and the little y is the starting point of uh, the process. And well, if this relation holds for every t, every x, and every y, I say that x uh, and y are h dual. So moment duality is a particular instance of uh, general duality in which the function that I use for the duality is x to the y, right? So it's the, it's the moment uh, function. <clears throat> so I say that x and y are moment dual if this condition holds true. And if you remember, this is exactly what we prove using a uh, sampling duality. Um, sampling duality is the technique of finding a duality using uh, probabilities, uh, sampling probabilities, like we discussed. And as far as I know, the technique of sampling duality was first uh, explained exactly as I, I just explained by Martin Mull in this uh, very nice paper in, in 99. But at least philosophically, this idea of going backwards and forwards and this uh, relation that things that live in the same graph have was used before. So probably you can think of who do you think uh, invented sampling duality. Some names um, could be, um, I don't know, Lamperti used similar ideas, um, Harris, um, definitely Liget. Um, but I claim that the idea of sampling duality, I mean, this moral of going backwards and forwards and saying probability doesn't depend on how you calculate it, it's uh, dated from even before. And it's actually an, an observation of, of Pascal. Um, so Fermat and Pascal were thinking about a game in which they throw coins and the first person to get five coins, say, uh, wins the game. And they wanted to know what's the probability of winning uh, this game. But the small pro complication was that it was the, the probability given that one of the players already won the first uh, toss. So one player wins the first one. What's the probability that this player win will, will get to five uh, tosses before uh, the other one? So we're talking about the beginning of probability. And this is a difficult calculation. Um, so Fermat was the first person to, to solve it. And he was very proud about this. Um, he um, solved it like directly. So he basically calculated all the ways that you can go from one to Fermat winning, right? So this representation means, um, if I'm in this point, means that Fermat have three points and um, Pascal have, have two. Right? So this is what this represents. Um, and what Fermat did was calculating all the different ways that one player can win, estimate the probability of each different path, the same for the other thing, and make some radio, and then obtain the, the correct solution. But the solution of Pascal, I think it's way more elegant. And what he's doing is saying, OK, let's just think backwards. If the game is in this point, so each player has four points, then either of them can win, and this will happen with probability one half, right? So the game can go from here to here with probability one half, or from here to here with probability one half. Okay, but if we already agree that this is the case here, well, if the game is here, it goes with probability one half here and with probability one half here. So then as I already solved this, I know that the probability of winning for Fermat at this point is simply three fourths. Okay, for sure it's a more beautiful way of solving the problem, but is it really moment dual? Is it really sampling duality? The reason I claim that it is sampling duality is because Pascal, in his correspondence to 
Fermat claims the probability is the same in Paris and Toulouse. So basically he's saying the way I, I calculate the problem uh, is equally valid at yours. And there is a relation in the two ways of calculating it because they are referring to the same problem. So maybe in more modern words or in more graphical words, what Pascal, um, what we can call the Pascal random graph, something that some graph that has one, uh, each vertex has one uh, ingoing edge and can be coming from above or it can be coming from the right. right? So it's one half each of these two possibilities. This gives us a random graph, right? And now the probability that this guy is connected here is just the probability that Fermat's win uh, the game. So we can put opinions here if we can, and then we have some sort of version of the Bowder model uh, induced by this graph. And we can also go in the other direction. And then what we have is coalescing random walks. This is definitely a sampling a duality if you put it in these terms. And well, it's connected. It's very similar to the duality of, of the Bowder model that is very well known. My relation to sampling duality uh, had been very strong. I will say it's my, my favorite technique. Um, I studied that. Uh, I study a random graph related to selection together with Darius Pano. Um, also, we thought about bottlenecks um, uh, together with Veronica Miropino and uh, Arno Sirijegos. We um, we thought about Helden formulas, which is the probability that one particular mutant with selective advantage goes to fixation with uh, Florin Boenkos, Cornelia Pocalio, and Anton Bakolvinger. Uh, and all these things are have some form of sampling duality inside. Also, uh, well, I am interested in, in a phenomena called coordination. Um, oops, my slides are moving slower there than here. So I don't know what is happening. OK. Um, yeah, so a phenomenon called coordination in which you have systems of particles and these particles, well, move according to some, some rule. But what I mean with coordination is that by some Poissonian mechanism, maybe several particles decide to move uh, simultaneously. And we studied together with uh, Noemi Kurt and Andreas Tobias uh, how this affects duality in this paper that I think it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, another instance of sampling duality is in the PhD thesis of uh, my student, uh, Lisbeth Peñalosa, uh, who is a student together with Arno Sirijagus. And she came up with many ideas that now we have tried to translate to the, to the simple exclusion process. And uh, the observation for those of you who, who are more in the side of population genetics, the observation is that uh, the simple exclusion process is a stepping stone model in which you have one individual per site. And if you think in these terms, then all the power of population genetics is somehow unleashed and you can, well, you can rediscover many things that are well known in, in your community, in the community of interacting particle systems, but also with some luck, we can get some, some different uh, insights. Um, yes, so the simple exclusion process, um, what is it? Well, you know it way better than me. You have some particles that move, oops, some particles that move inside a, a graph of your favorite graph, and they interact by the rule of exclusion. So this one cannot jump on top of this other. And also we will be interested in cases where there are reservoirs. So there are some outside forces that are throwing particles into the system. So maybe, for example, we can see one particle entering from here. And they also are capable of taking particles out uh, of the system. Right? So this is uh, our model. Um, 
And the starting point of, of me thinking about this was a very uh, nice and, and, and intense interaction with Simone Floriani, who is in, he, he made his PhD with um, Frank Reddick, and together with Federico Sao, they work in this very nice uh, paper about duality for the simple exclusion process with reservoirs. And when Simone and I started discussing, we noticed that we both were talking about duality, but our language and our way of thinking about it was uh, extremely different. So this is the duality uh, that they were uh, discussing. It's a duality between the simple exclusion process with reservoirs and the simple exclusion process with, with absorption. It has this shape of this function that doesn't look immediately like some moment duality, but it turns out it is. And somehow the story I want to tell you is how to translate this, this duality into some graphical uh, duality, into some more probabilistic um, interpretation of, of this relation between self perturbed and, and self absorbed. <clears throat> so this one is Simone Floriani. Uh, he's in Oxford, but soon in Bonn. Um, yes, so, so the question we, we, we answered or we, we attacked is what is the stationary distribution of um, this simple exclusion process uh, with reservoirs? And we, we are interested in, in the case with more than one uh, reservoir, but let's start with with one because the idea will be uh, very similar. So we have this uh, process, particles move inside, they come from this outside world and they escape in this outside world. So what is the stationary distribution here? Um, the first observation is that we can think about particles that move, but we can also think that there are two kinds of particles. So we can think that there are real particles and empty empty particles, right? So empty spaces, we can see as this other type of particles. And then we can ask the question, how, uh, what is the, 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 the movements of these other kinds of particles? And the nice observation is that the particles of both type move according to exactly the same rules. So what we have is that the edges, uh, have a Poisson clock, so they ring at some um, rate. And whenever this happens, what you see is that the two particles at the end of the edge, they just swap. This is called the steering coupling of the, of the set. So if we see here, for example, whenever you see this edge swap, you will move this real particle and this um, imaginary particle or this empty particle so what you're really saying is that this particle move, right? If you swap to real particles, well, you really don't see anything because you cannot differentiate between two particles, right? So these swaps are invisible to the eyes of the set. And if you swap to empty spaces, also you don't see anything. But the observation is that empty particles and real particles obey the same uh, rules. So what happened with the reservoir? Well, the reservoir is also playing its game, taking particles uh, in and out. And we can take this um, rate uh, uh, R in, which is the rate in which you throw a particle in, uh, and this R out, which is the rate at which you take a particle out. You can think them as there is only one rate, which is the sum of the two, right? And as, at this rate, what you will see is that this edge swaps, right? So at rate R, which is the sum of R in plus R out, what you see is that this edge swaps. But when this edge swaps, well, it will put in a particle or it will put in an empty space. And this will happen with probability R in divided by R in plus R out, right? Okay, 
So what is the, the outside world doing? We can imagine that it's somehow giving you a box. And this box contains a particle with probability p and nothing with probability 1 minus p. And if we open the box, then we see what is inside. And it's either a particle or not. But we don't really need to open the box to see how the dynamic will continue. Because particles and emptiness move according to the same rule. So what we can do is just say, well, whenever the whenever the, the edge, the special edge rings, I exchange whatever is here by a box, right? Now, this box might be swapped by an empty space, right? All the other particles can move. Maybe now I see this one ring again, which means that another box enters the system. Maybe now this two swap. and so on and so forth. And after some time, what I will see is that every particle that I knew, so every starting condition has gone out and I have covered everything with boxes, right? And this is an argument to believe that, well, what is a box? A box is a Bernoulli random variable with parameter P. So this is an argument to convince yourself that the stationary distribution in this case is nothing more than the product of uh, independent Bernoulli, right? I put boxes everywhere, and whenever I see um, a swap now, I'm changing a box by another box, so I'm not changing uh, anything. This is this is an invariant distribution. Okay, um, they became spiders for some reason. Sorry. Um, so now let's um, let's. Um, consider that there are two reservoirs, which is the most interesting case, um, or more, so they could be uh, more than, than two reservoirs. And what I have is that this reservoir one throws particles at some rate, takes particles at some rate, and this doesn't have to be the same as in the other, in the other uh, reservoir. So what happened uh, in this case? Basically, what I want you to, to see is that the very nice duality of Floriani, Reddick, and Sau is exactly this putting boxes inside uh, the graph, right? So this boxes game is the duality of um, Floriani, um, Reddick, and Sau. Um, so let's, let's see how, how this looks. So imagine that I see my system at some time that I call zero, but my system has been going on for ages. So it is in some sort of stationarity. And I want to know what is the distribution uh, at this point that I call zero. Well, if each of the reservoirs is throwing boxes that have the same probability of being occupied, then my previous argument tells me that the stationary distribution is the same as before. So I could cover everything with boxes and every box has the same probability of being occupied and then life is good. Okay, so let's put ourselves in a more interesting case. What if this reservoir is doing something quite different than this other reservoir? So what do I need to know in order to calculate the stationary distribution now? The thing is that if you tell me that this box was created in this reservoir, then I know that it contained a particle with probability PR. And if you tell me that this box was created here, I know that it contains a particle with probability PL. So if you tell me who constructed which box, immediately I can tell you, okay, they are just Bernoulli's, but they have different uh, parameters depending who uh, created them. So let's play the picture backwards to find out who creates which particle. So I just need to play the picture backwards and see where did these boxes came from. So after the first swap backwards in time, for example, I see that this one and this one swap. And after one more, maybe I see that this box jumped here. 
and now emptiness and this one swap and then this one got absorbed and then this one got absorbed and if you now think that the boxes are particles what you are seeing is exactly the simple exclusion uh, process with absorption right so the boxes are particles now in this simple exclusion process with absorption so they have this exclusion rule and they enter the reservoirs and whenever they enter the reservoirs that they are just absorbed uh, forever and once i i finish the the game so now i have everyone absorbed either here or here, then I have all the information I need to determine what is the stationary distribution. Because I know that orange and green come from this reservoir, so they will be occupied with probability PR. And the other three points will be occupied with probability PL, because they were absorbed at this time. Because being absorbed backwards in time means being created forward uh, in time. Um, so I can mark each of the points according to who created the box that was on top of them. This is a random variable. So for this point x, for example, then I write ux. ux is a random variable that can take the value pr or pl depending on who created this box. <clears throat> and then the, the formal statement is that the stationary distribution is just a product of Bernoulli's, but these Bernoulli's have a random um, parameter, right? So, so now you have a vector of parameters, uh, ux for each side, uh, x in, uh, in one to n. <clears throat> And this is the shape of the stationary distribution. And this construction works basically in, in extremely general cases. So it doesn't matter which graph you take, it doesn't matter how much, how many reservoirs uh, you put, you will have some description of the measure uh, in these terms. Right? Now, the question is, can you say something more explicit? And the answer is, well, yes, you can, as soon as you can say things about you, right? So if you can calculate the probabilities of absorption of the different sites, then you can say everything about the mesh. So an equivalent way to write this uh, mu is, well, here I'm just writing what is the, the, the expectation. So I write it as a sum. And what I see is, is that it, this is just a mixture of uh, Bernoulli's and they are mixed by these factors F that I can now write in these terms. And at the end, it turns out that I can write the, the measure in a completely explicit way if I can calculate these probabilities. And what are these probabilities? Well, what I need to calculate is if you give me any starting configuration, for example, here I have this, this, and this, which is this, this, and this, what I need to calculate is the probability that all these boxes are absorbed at the right uh, reservoir. So if for every condition, if for every starting condition that you give me, I am capable of calculating the probability that all of these particles go up, go to the end reservoir, then I can explicitly um, describe this uh, mu style. So this description works always, but it becomes uh, explicit if and only if I can write what is this probability. So the task is, well, to find examples in which we can actually write this uh, explicitly. And this is an ongoing task, but I can already say one example in which we can say everything. And that example is uh, the interval graph. So we have um, points from zero to, oh, sorry. So it's from zero to N, should be like this. <clears throat> and particles get absorbed at zero and they get absorbed uh, at N. So in this case, we can 
write everything uh, explicitly. And somehow our result then is a probabilistic alternative to the well-known uh, matrix product ansatz because Derrida, Evans, uh, Hakim, and uh, Pasquier were able to describe the stationary distribution in the set of the set exactly for this graph. And they use some matrix uh, methods and basically what we are doing is our duality construction and some probabilistic uh, arguments that I will try to sketch in the next um, few minutes. So our result is that these probabilities of absorption in the case of um, the segment graph are explicit and they have this uh, form here. So if I have a K plus one particles starting in the size x1, x2, blah, 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 until x uh, k plus one, then the probability that all these particles is absorbed at the last side is this product uh, here. Um, how do we prove this? I like this proof because it's very probabilistic. Um, well, let's just consider the set with this k plus one uh, particles in this graph from zero to n. And all the game is about labelings. So we label the particles, particle one, particle two, particle k, and the last particle receives the name of the ninja. And the, the ninja is called the ninja because it's a very special particle. So it's a particle that will not be detected by all the other particles. So it moves around without uh, being noticed. And what we have is that, well, this system of particles will move like a step, will behave like a step. And down, you have a system of all the particles that are not a ninja, and they are moving like a step, but from zero to n minus one, and they have one particle less. They don't see the ninja. So let me try to explain uh, how this trick works. So what can happen? Particles can move. So this particle move like in the set, maybe it moves here, which means that in the other world, you also see a movement. This particle cannot move at all in any world. This particle, for example, could move here or could move here. Um, and the ninja also can move like a, like a simple exclusion process if there is no interaction. So for example, here the ninja uh, moves. The interesting thing happens when a particle is very close to the ninja, because in this world, this particle cannot move here because, well, there is the exclusion rule. But in this world, this particle actually don't know that there is a problem here. So it's allowed for this particle to jump here, right? And the whole trick is to resolve what happened whenever this particle downstairs try to jump here. And what's happened is that, well, this particle moved here, maybe. These particles cannot follow but this particle can follow, right? So what we do is say, well, if this is what happened, the ninja gets relabeled and moved to this position, right? So let's see what happened. The particle downstairs move, And something strange happened. <clears throat> well, I tried. I, I hope that it was not completely unclear. My picture didn't work. But the point is that the the, the particle downstairs moves. The ninja moves to the other position, and this particle is now co coupled with this particle here, right? So what you have is a uh, relabeling. And the importance of this thing is that 
this trick connects a set with one particle more with a set with one particle less. Right? And in order to have all these particles go into N, you need two things. You need that all these particles go to N minus one and the ninja also go to N. Right? So we can write the probability of absorption of these k plus one particles in the segment of size n as the probability of absorption of one particle less in a segment of one site less times the probability that the ninja also, also goes to absorption. <clears throat> okay, but if I wasn't completely unclear of, of the dynamic of the ninja, you can see that whenever a particle pass the ninja, the ninja gets a push, right? So it's not moving independently of the other particles. So how can we calculate the probability that the ninja gets absorbed? Well, the very nice thing is that the position of the ninja uh, has a very nice martingale associated. So the position of the ninja minus the number of particles that it has to the left is a martingale. Because whenever you see this interaction that pushes the ninja, then one particle moves to the other side, and this compensates um, this compensates the bump. And with this martingale, we can actually calculate explicitly the probability that the ninja go to absorption. And this gives us a very nice re uh, recursion that connect the probability of, of all the particles absorbed uh, until k plus one with all the particles absorbed until k. So this recursion can be solved and this is exactly uh, what you get. <clears throat> okay, so we are close to the end. The summary is in general for your favorite graph and even in more general than is written here for more reservoirs, you have a nice expression of the of the stationary distribution in terms of mixtures of uh, Bernoulli random variables. And if you want to make this into an uh, explicit formula, what you need is to study this process, uh, this random vector uh, of um, who was created where. This vector can be computed explicitly in the case of, of the interval. And for me, an important observation is that sampling duality, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful rule that maybe brings another way to think about uh, these relations between uh, processes. About future work, well, the duality holds in this uh, unexplicit way everywhere, but we want to calculate it explicitly. And some cases in which we think that it's possible to do things is when you have one uh, more than one site uh, uh, per position, like a partial exclusion. Um, I have sketched some calculations that um, in graphs that are not very far from, every point is very close to the reservoirs. You can again explicitly write um, the absorption probabilities and then you can write the, the stationary distribution explicitly. Um, I would like to add coordination to the ninja story, meaning that instead of having the sep that moves like this, maybe you have these two particles that jump simultaneously. <clears throat> and this preserves the graph, uh, the, the duality structure, and hopefully the ninja the structure. And well, somehow we managed to see the duality for, for the sep uh, in a pathwise, pathwise way and using some different techniques. Um, and this was very exciting program. So now uh, why not try to do similar things with, 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 with other uh, interesting models like the SIP and, and others. <clears throat> and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions?
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, may, may I, I pose a question? Yes, Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Could you repeat, please, the, 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 the coupling with the ninja particle? Because uh, you, you keep your order in the, that, that coupling. How, how is it? Sure. So basically, um, so the whole point is that you relabel the particles up in such a way that when you remove, so so maybe I didn't explain this. So if you see all the particles that are to the to the right of the ninja, they lose one position, right? So you are subtracting the position of the ninja to everybody who is in the right, right? So this is. But, but the, 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 the ninja ne never swaps position with another particle. Is that, is that right? No. Um. In some sense. So so let me let me try to 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 play with this. Um, um let's see yeah so this one is less destroyed so imagine that you have a particle here right so this particle do not know that it's not allowed to move to the left right yeah. so it will move to the left at rate one as always and then mm -hmm. how do you couple the upper part what you do is that you move this particle to the left, right? But this will break the coupling bit because, well, now this one is coupled with the ninja and you don't want that, right? So what you do is you do a relabeling. So now the ninja is in position seven uh -huh. and the other particles is in position five. Okay, better, better now, thanks. And if you remove the labels, that's exactly the same in both posts, in both uh, worlds. You do that at once, uh, yeah. When then the ninja goes to seven. Okay. Right. So if you think in the in what is occupied and what what is not, you are performing a set in in both worlds. When when I have a, oh, 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 ah. now now have only one part to the right of the ninja, the, the particle, the 10th particle in the position 10, right? Yeah. When, what happens when this particle try, uh, tries to, to, to jump to the position of the ninja guy? Right, so now imagine that um, this is, well, I, I, it's not so easy to move my, my picture, but let's try. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so imagine that it's like this. Um, yeah. So now, indeed, so, so this, let's call this particle a, and this is particle A, right? A. So A and A should be coupled in both worlds, right? So the problem is that if this one jump here, this one cannot follow. Yes. So what you do is this one is the one that follows and you relabel. Okay, nice. And then what you see is that whenever a particle jumps the ninja, the ninja receives a push, right? So mm -hmm. it, the ninja was not trying to move, but because the other particle crossed, then the relabeling moves the ninja. And this explains why the position of the ninja minus the number of particles in one side is a martingale, right? Because every time they cross, you see this, this push that change this. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Thanks, very, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so May I just, ask? Uh, what's that is, uh, like, Sorry, can I just ask a quick question? Adrian, I am Patricia. So um, this introduction of the ninja is because you want to compute these probabilities that all the particles go to the right or either to the left, right? right. And when you talk, when you mentioned this, somehow I remember that the wallet you can uh, use the, something very similar to write the, explicitly the stationary correlations, right? But but my question is, couldn't you write, uh, let's say, a discrete PDE for this for these probabilities and try to get explicit expressions um, by solving the PDE? Isn't this possible? Because for the stationary correlations, it is. So that's why I was thinking, what could be the problem here? Um, Do you have any? No, I, I mean, I think that the 
problem for many i mean i i think that there will be many nice opportunities to 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 use techniques i, I think the problem why i haven't tried this because i'm very new in this party right? <laughs> <All> <laughs> i don't right, know this okay. but, no, it... but i believe that uh, okay. many of these things can be studied with the techniques that you have and, okay. and, and this community have so yeah, i think that is very promising to now start mixing be Ideas, yeah. Because at the end you have an explicit expression, right, for this probability. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. remember now the exact formula, but okay, okay. Anyway, thank yeah. you. That, it was very no, nice. Definitely, thank I you. think it's it's a very nice idea to now use this uh, explicit expression to try to say things. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other? Yes. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Very really nice talk. Very really nice result. Uh, I just want to make an observation that uh, this U process is also a, <clears throat> a symmetric simple solution with boundary conditions that are deterministic, zero to the left and one to the right, right? Right. And, th and then you have an expression for the invariant measure. Uh, and I just wanted to say that there is a, a, an answer for this kind of um, symmetric uh, processes with uh, boundary conditions, with open boundaries. That is that uh, the measure is pro product measure with uh, a random parameter. And this random parameter is, is the invariant measure for some other process that in the case of uh, of KPZ, is, uh, the other process is like an opinion model. I don't want to explain this here. But uh, can you get an expression like that uh, in this case? Um, so I'm not sure I, I, I understand, but indeed I think our way of, of, of thinking of, of the U can result in, in connection with other ways of expressing the stationary distribution uh, indeed. But uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to discuss this idea uh, uh, further, but I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, say anything at this, at this time about that. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. I have a question. Uh, in the beginning, when you are calculating the stationary measure with one reservoir, you are putting boxes in the, the space and waiting to the space be filled with boxes. And you found oh, the stationary measure is the time you need to, uh, is the product measure of such boxes, such bandwidths. But in your talk, it sounds like you can calculate uh, mixing times for the, the map of chain. Like one measure is the weight to have everything filled with boxes. But I try, if you have an idea for two, bo uh, two reasonable bars or anything like that, Right, so that's a that's a very very nice uh, observation indeed. So the the what you can calculate or what you can describe immediately is a strong stationary time. So when you play the the game backwards and you wait until the first time that all the boxes are absorbed, right? So when when your your backward step is completely absorbed. This is a strong stationary time, right? So if you are capable of studying this uh, strong stationary time in a reasonable way, you can say things about the, the mixing time. And this trick again works for, for 1 million reservoirs uh, if you want. How easy or difficult is to say something about this uh, strong stationary time? Then I don't know. I guess that maybe in easy situations like the interval, you can do it, but it's probably done uh, already. But in more complicated graph, well, it it will not be uh, trivial. But definitely, it's it's a it's a 
it's a program, right? So it's, it's something uh, to think about. And, uh, and I, what, I, what I like is that all these questions become very probabilistic somehow, right? So all these questions now translate in absorption probabilities of something. Or, yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. That's a very Thanks. nice observation. Thanks. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's let's uh, thank Adrian again for a very nice talk. And uh, we meet again next week, same time. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.